following lecture is aimed for senior dental students, interns, dental trainees, oral surgery and oral maxillofacial surgery residents, as well as master and doctor degree candidates. In memory of my late parents, may almighty merciful God rest their souls in heaven and peace. So first of all, please allow me to give a brief bio about the speaker. My name is Muhammad Ahmed al -Shulkami. I'm currently a professor and the chairman of the Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery Department at the Faculty of Dentistry, Suez Canal University in Ismailia, Egypt. Actually, Ismailia is one of the most beautiful cities in Egypt. It is located around 80 miles to the eastern of Cairo, overlooking the Timsah or Crocodile Lake and Suez Canal. Ismailia was founded by and named after one of the great rulers of Egypt in the 19th century. He was Ismail Pasha or Khidiw Ismail. He was the one who did the opening ceremonies of the Suez Canal in 1869. Beautiful scenery is always seen in Ismailia. You have a greenery landscape overlooking lovely blue sea, and I think it's worth visiting. And that's the place where I work. This is the Faculty of Dentistry Complex. It's comprised of three main buildings. I'm also the professor and the supervisor of the Oral Maxillofacial Surgery Department at Faculty of Dentistry, Sinai University, Kantara Campus in Ismailia. I also worked as a part-time associate professor at MIU University and MSA University for several years. I'm a visiting professor at the Faculty of Dentistry, Beirut Arab University in the Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery Department in Beirut, Lebanon. I'm also the managing director of the Egyptian Dental Center, a multi-speciality discipline dental and maxillofacial center based in Cairo, Egypt. And our topic for this lecture today is the management of maxillofacial infection, the acute dental alveolar abscess. Our main topics are as follows. Understanding the basic etiological factors for maxillofacial infection. Knowledge of basic microbiology involved in abscess formation, understanding the pathogenesis and sequelae of dental alveolar abscess, knowledge of clinical picture of both early and late stages of dental alveolar abscess, and last but not the least, understand the different factors governing the spread of infection. By definition, dental alveolar abscess is a polygenic, which means pus forming. Infections, they are associated with teeth and their surrounding structures, such as periodontium and alveolar bone. However, the clinical presentation of the maxillofacial infection depends on several factors, among which the variance of the of microorganisms and the local and systemic defense mechanisms of the host himself, and last but not the least, the anatomical features of the region. Side, you can see the eternal battle between the microbes with virulence and quantity facing the host factors or the defensive mechanisms of the host in the form of local, humoral, and cellular defenses. And of course, the balance is always in the favor of the host. However, for infection to occur and established and to spread, there has to be imbalance in such a relationship in the favor of the microbial factors. On the left hand side, we can see that infection can provoke inflammation and hyperemia and vascular response, which leads to plasma exudate containing immunoglobulins and complement. And furthermore, chemotaxis signaling attracts cells like polymorphonuclear leukocytes and phagocytes to combat bacteria. And here is a representative diagram of the host defenses. We have local factors, skin and mucous membrane, with the epithelial lining, protection, secretions and drainage, microbial flora itself, and mucous immune system. In the middle, we can see the humoral defense mechanisms with synthesis of immunoglobulins, which activates the complement system, and for obstinance, which activates or helps phagocytosis. On the right-hand side, we can see the cellular components, the lymphocytes and phagocytes, polymorphonuclear leukocytes and phagocytes which combat bacteria and phagocytose the microorganisms. And so, depending on the interactions of such factors, the resulting infection may present as follows. 
may be a simple abscess localized to the tooth that initiated the infection in the first place, or a diffuse cellulitis that spreads along fascial planes or different fascial spaces of the face and the neck, or a mixture of both. But first of all, let's go back to square one and see how and why did this happen at the first place. It started initially as enamel decay, which furthermore digs further and go to dentine, then it reaches the pulp, leading to pulp exposure, furthermore pulp necrosis and the infection goes beyond the apex of the tooth and start to form the abscess. This is how it goes, carious tooth. There are other ways that in which microbes can reach the pulp, maybe through traumatic tooth fracture or mandibular fracture, compound mandibular fracture, also by traumatic exposure of the pulp during dental treatment, which we call iatrogenic exposure, and also through the periodontal membrane via periodontitis or pericoronitis, which we call the endoperio problem, and rarely by anachoresis or anachoretic pulpitis, which means sealing of microorganisms directly into the pulp via the pulpal blood supply. And this should happen when the patient is suffering from bacteremia, maybe from other infection at other site, or maybe from tooth extraction at a different site in the oral cavity. And of course, such, in such patient, there has to be uh, lowered immunity of, of the patient. And now let's go to review the major pathogens in odontogenic infection. Sakamoto et al. 1988 and Heimdall et al. 1985, they have summed up most of the microorganisms involved in maxillofacial infection, which are streptococcus miliary group, peptostreptococcus species, other anaerobic streptococci, provotella species, for example, Provotella oralis, Porphyromonas species, like Porphyromonas gingivalis, and last but not the least, Fusobacterium species. Also, we need to know the role of anaerobic bacteria or aerobic bacteria in odontogenic infections. The anaerobic bacteria comprises around 50% of the cases. Mixed anaerobic or aerobic bacteria are present in 44% of the cases, where aerobic bacteria only in 6% of the cases. The bacteria involved in maxillofacial infection are aerobic gram-positive cocci, anaerobic gram-positive cocci, and last but not the least, anaerobic gram-negative rods. And so, before going further, we need to know that the maxillofacial infections are not a one-man show, or not for a single player. They need a team of multiple bacteria to be involved in establishing and initiating and spreading of such an infection. The predominant aerobic bacteria involved in the maxillofacial or odontogenic infections, they are found in about 65% of the cases, are the Streptococcus miliary group. They consist of three members of the Streptococcus veridens, which are Streptococcus aeruginosus, Streptococcus intermedius, and Streptococcus constellatus. These are facultative organisms by nature, they can grow in the presence and in the absence of oxygen, and so they start to initiate the process of spreading into deeper tissues, being able to shift from aerobic to anaerobic. Moreover, we have also anaerobic streptococcus and peptostreptococcus. Oral gram-negative anaerobic rods are also cultured in about three-quarters of the cases. Furthermore, Provotella and Porphyromonas are also found in about 75% of the cases. Last but not the least, Fused bacteria are present in more than 50%. On the other hand, the anaerobic gram negative cocci and the anaerobic gram positive rods appear to have a little or no role in starting the odontogenic infection. However, they are considered to be opportunistic organisms. And after initial inoculation into the deeper tissues, the facultative streptococcus miliary group, which are able to survive in lack of oxygen, can synthesize hyaluronidase enzyme which in turn destroys the ground substance of connective tissue and allowing the infective microorganisms to spread further into the tissues and initiating a cellulitis type of infection. At that stage, the metabolic byproducts from the streptococci create a favorable environment for the growth of anaerobes, which are the release of essential nutrients needed by them and the lowered acidic pH in the tissues and further consumption of local oxygen supplies. And anaerobic bacteria take over and they in turn synthesize collagenase and the collagenase enzyme will lead to liquefaction necrosis and breakdown of the tissues. And as collagen is broken down, we have also 
the dead cells from both sides, from white blood cells and from the bacteria, they tend to necrose and lies and forming micro abscesses. And when such micro abscesses coalesce together, they lead to the clinically recognizable abscess formation. And accordingly, in the abscess stage, the androidic bacteria predominate and they may eventually be the becoming only microorganisms found in the culture. So, in early infections appearing initially as cellulitis, they might be characterized as an aerobic streptococci infection. But, however, when the chronic abscess is formed, it is characterized as an aerobic infection. Coming to the clinical features, the clinical signs and symptoms, as previously mentioned, depend on the site of the infection, the degree and mode of spread, the variance of the causative microorganism, and last but not the least, the efficiency of the host defense mechanisms. So let's have a look on the clinical signs and symptoms of the acute dental viral abscess, the early stage. At the early stage, the patient suffers from pain in the affected area when touching or biting the tooth, and the tooth feels, uh, the patient tells you that it feels high, it feels higher than the rest of the occlusion, or, or, or it, it touches first with the opposing arch. The patient also has sensitivity to cold, hot and food and liquids, and maybe foul taste and foul discharge in the mouth. The patient complains also of fever and general unwell feeling. At that stage, the abscess is only confined to the area around the apex of the tooth and it is locked within the alveolar bone between the apex and the alveolar bone. So there is intense throbbing pain. And frankly speaking, this is the main chief complaint of the patient. It's intense throbbing pain in the affected area. This pain comes suddenly and it, it gets gradually and grows gradually and it spreads to the ear, uh, jaw and neck on the affected side and sometimes you find referred pain to further areas. The pain also worsens when the patient lies down so it dist might disturb his sleep and leading to insomnia. So what about the acute dental viral abscess the late stage? At that stage the pus was successful to perforate the alveolar bone and exit outside in a a form of subperiosteal abscess or in the soft tissue abscess in the vestibule or in the external skin surface, under the external skin surface. And at that stage, the persistent throbbing toothache can adhere to jaw, bone, neck and ear, but however, at that stage, the pain decreases dramatically in comparison to the early stage. The sensitivity to hot and cold uh, temperatures remains and sensitivity to pressure or chewing or biting, but it, it is of course less than that of the acute dental alveolar abscess the early stage. The patient may complain from fever, facial intraoral cheek or vestibular swelling. In that stage we have uh, external swelling, a skin swelling or facial swelling or in a vestibular or a cheek swelling in intraorally. And of course we have some medibular lymphadenopathy or swollen and tender lymph nodes. So we need to know after pus formation what's going to happen where it's going to go, what is the fate or the sequelae of, of such abscess formation. Will it be localized at the tooth apex or become an acute or a chronic abscess or go into focal osteomyelitis? On the right hand side we can see different blue arrows in the figure showing where this pus can go. It can go in the outside to do a swelling, uh, cheek swelling or a vestibular swelling in the upper jaw or spread into the maxillary sinus or onto the palatal surfaces. On the lower jaw, it might go lead to submandibular abscess or sublingual abscess or a vestibular abscess or a cheek or buccal abscess. So, as going to be mentioned afterwards, it's going to different areas according to the anatomical site of the infection at the first place. So, if direct spread happens, it might spread into the superficial soft tissues and lead to a localized soft tissue abscess which extends from the overlying mucosa or the skin and if left untreated it might lead to a draining sinus linking the main abscess cavity with the external skin or the oral mucosa. Or it might go without sinus formation and it spreads through the soft tissue leading to facial cellulites as seen on the right hand side figure. And it should be noted 
that the path spread always seeks the path of the least resistance. So spread may occur into different adjacent fascial spaces or between the different tissue planes and the anatomical area for this spread will depend on the original abscess where it started at the first place. And on the right hand side we can see and in, 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 uh, in rare cases we can have involvement of submandibular and sublingual spaces bilaterally which leads to a, a clinical serious situation known as Ludwig's angina. Another route, the infection may extend deeper into medullary spaces of the alveolar bone, producing spreading osteomyelitis. But of course, this needs the patient to be a little bit immunocompromised or debilitated patient. In the maxillary teeth, there is another place where infection can go. It can spread into the maxillary sinus, leading to second, secondary maxillary sinusitis. And in some rare situations it might spread furthermore upwards and go to the cavernous sinus or the furthermore via the venous uh, uh, sinuses and venous drainage into the brain abscess and meningitis. However, indirect spread can go also to the lymphatic routes leading to submental or submandibular or upper deep cervical lymphadenopathy. The lymph node become tender, swollen and painful and sometimes it also suppurate and in this case, it will need to incision and drainage. Impetorsional spread is rare, or it might go to other organisms, and of course, it's a serious case if it goes up to the prey. And here is a comparison, a simple comparison, according to some criteria between cellulitis and abscess. The cellulitis ranges from 1 to 5 days to develop, while abscess need more days, up to 10 days. The pain on the borders, the cellulitis has diffuse borders and the abscess tend to be more localized. Of course, the abscess has less pain than the cellulites. The size, the cellulites is large, much, much more larger than the abscess, the abscess is more localized and the cellulitis has the red color of the skin and mucosa while the abscess has a shiny center due to collection of pus. The consistency of the cellulitis is board-like, whereas the consistency of the abscess has a soft center or flatulent center. In case of cellulitis, the progression of the condition is increasing, while in the abscess it is decreasing or lead, tending to be more localized. Of course, the abscess uh, has pus collection, while in the case of cellulitis there is absence of pus formation. And the microbiology is considered in the abscess, as we previously mentioned, anaerobic. And in case of cellulitis, it is mixed between anaerobic and anaerobic. And coming to the seriousness, the cellulitis is much more greater in, as a serious condition. And the abscess tends to be less serious because it is tending to be more localized. And incision and drainage can end the problem. And as previously mentioned, there are different roots where infection can spread to, but we need to know what are the factors governing the spread of infection. First, the position of the tooth in the alveolus or the alveolar bone. On the left hand side on figure A, we can see that the apex tends to be near to the buccal plate of bone or the labial plate of bone, and the green arrow shows that the distance is smaller than that of the red arrow towards the palatal plate of bone. And accordingly, the pus as we said before, it goes to the way of the least resistance, so it's going to perforate labially or buccally and leading to a buccal vestibular abscess. On the other hand, on the right hand side, figure B, we see that the tooth apex is a little bit tilted towards the palatal plate of bone, and the green arrow palatally is much more less than the distance to the labial plate of bone, and so the pus is going to perforate on the palatal side leading to palatal abscess. The second factor is the position of the muscle attachments in relation to the involved tooth APCs. The muscle attachment is a strong barrier to pus traveling and it prevents pus from spreading further. So pus needs to seek a way around the muscle and either it is beneath it or, or above it. So in the, can we see the figure A on the left hand side, the blue arrow is pointing to a vestibular abscess because the tooth apex is shorter or below the muscle attachment. 
So the pus is going to open in a vestibular form or form a vestibular abscess intraorally. On the other hand, in figure B, on the right hand side, the red arrow is pointing to an extraoral buccal abscess because the apex of the tooth is a little bit higher than the muscle attachment, so the pus is going to bypass the muscle attachment and open extraorally. Last but not the least, the orientation of different tissue, fascial spaces, and planes. The anatomic spaces involved in the odontogenic infections, we have deep fascial spaces involved with any tooth, like the vestibular, it's according to the muscle attachment. If you look at the figure on the right hand side, we have the vaccinator muscle, has a relation muscle attachment in the upper jaw and the lower jaw. So, as we said before, for example, in the upper jaw, if the apex is below the muscle attachment, it's going to go in the vestibular abscess. If the apex throws the pus above the muscle attachment, it's going to have a buccal space abscess on the uh, external skin. And vice versa on the lower jaw. So we have vestibular abscess or a buccal abscess and subcutaneous abscess. The deep fascial spaces associated with maxillary teeth, we have the infraorbital space, buccal space, and the infratemporal space, and maxillary and other paranasal sinus space, as we said before, that infection can spread into the maxillary sinus, leading to secondary maxillary sinusitis. And last but not the least, and the very serious condition, if infection spreads further more upwards into the cavernous sinus, leading to cavernous sinus thrombosis. And here let's review the deep fascial spaces associated with mandibular teeth. We have first of all the space of the body of the mandible, and then we have two groups. The first is called perimandibular spaces, which comprises the submandibular space and sublingual space and submental space. And the other group is called masticator space, which comprises four compartments, the submasteric space, pterygomandibular space, and superficial temporal and deep temporal. So let's start with the submandibular or perimandibular spaces. Let's look to the figure on the right hand side and the lingual side of the mandible where we have the mylohyoid muscle attachment. It's according to the attachment or the level of the apex in relation to the attachment, it, which will dictate that the spread of the infection is going to be intraorally in the sublingual space or extraorally in the submandibular space. For example, if you have uh, uh, infection related to the apex of the lower second molar, the lower second molar have its APCs below the attachment of the mylohyoid, so it's going to lead to a submandibular space infection. On the other hand, when you go to the masticator space, it is related to the muscles of mastication, and in this case, the patient is going to suffer also in the clinical picture from trismus, because any inflammation around one of the uh, masticatory muscles is going to lead to trismus. The patient will not be able to open his mouth. And so, you can see the submasteric space, it is the space bound between the masseter muscle and the ramus of the mandible. It's a very limited space, so involvement of such space will lead to severe trismus and intense pain. On the other hand, the pterygomandibular space, it is further medially, it is, lies between the medial pterygoid muscle and the medial surface of the ramus of the mandible, and it is this space in which we give the inferior alveolar nerve block, where the needle touches the bone behind the lingula and the entrance of the inferior alveolar nerve in the, into the mandibular canal. And upwards we can see the superficial temporal space and deep temporal space and this is according to the temporalis muscle. It's either superficial temporal or deep temporal space. Last but not the least, we can review the deep fascial spaces of the neck. We have the lateral pharyngeal space, which is medial to the medial pterygoid muscle and it's lateral to the lateral pharyngeal wall. And we have the retropharyngeal space, which is behind the pharynx, and the pretracheal space, and dangerous space, and prevertebral space. Of course, all these spaces are going to be discussed in detail in the video related to the fascial spaces and spread of infection. Nelson Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Rest in peace, Nelson Mandela. And finally, I would like to thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you so much.